All right, guys, so we have finished up all of our testing at this point, and now we need to sit down and actually have a discussion about how the guns are matching up with our first impressions. We need to see where we're at now. So what do we want to really start out with first? I mean, for y'all, it may have been just a few minutes, but now we're, we're a few days past this. We've done all the guns. So where are we at? Well, mostly I'm tired and my elbow's hurt. Yeah, I got some knee pain, not, not going to lie. We all got some of that, yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah. forget, for everything that was filmed in a minute, we were lying down, we're taking camera positions, we're fiddling with mags, making sure they're working. Some of us, me and I especially, are running around actually working the camera equipment. Some lazy sucker. I'm just sitting there getting to shoot guns. That's oh, pretty yeah. cool. Um, actually, before we go any further, thank you for our range volunteers, John Clear and uh, Bruno and Jay from our own team. And then and Susie as well. She was definitely keeping us on track for, you know, making sure we were on schedule. Yeah, the fact that we have all this stuff in order is on her. And then um, kind of a miracle too. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a it's been hectic. I'm sorry that you were subjected to our process, but um, we are at the end of it, and so we do need to make a call. I know a lot of you guys are going to want to hear what is a winner, right? So, right, but you have to wait because we have to embarrass ourselves by citing our actual experience versus our ignorant expectations. Yeah. It's true. All right. So what was our first gun that we discussed? First one, I have it here on the permanent record, is the Hotchkiss. <laughs> okay, so how did we feel about the Hotchkiss? Well, we hated the sight. That was like one of the things that stood out. Probably the thing that we referenced the most with some reservations about the feed strip, but I think by the time we're done, I'm going to tell you, I don't remember noticing the sight as a problem. I, I don't. I don't think anything I failed on that gun had anything to do with the sight. And honestly, it seemed like it sighted just fine. Mm -hmm. Like once I was out in the daylight with it, I could read it every time. Oh yeah, it was a yeah. and it was a matter of like actually staying lined up on the site while it was shooting though, unfortunately. And then you were talking in the impressions about the crow's feet and how you thought those were going to perform. Yeah, that bipod was still definitely awkward. Yeah, that I was on say. that was on point. Yeah, a uh, double section. Ugh. But what's surprising to me. First off, the one thing we didn't fully appreciate the awfulness of was the reloading procedure oh, and those yeah, feed no. strips. They're terrible. Now, some of that's because I've handled, I don't know about you guys, I've, May and I have handled uh, Hotchkiss 1914, which is the original where the feed strip lays in and just sort of feeds with the cartridges up and the strip down. That is extremely easy to get those started. This is inverted and that suddenly, don't get me wrong, it makes the gun smaller and lighter, but god awful to load. What... On the other hand, what I hadn't anticipated in my initial expectations was, despite all the problems, all the things that are anti-ergonomic about this gun, it still actually did fairly well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, it shot better, it performed better than I expected. I didn't like shooting it, but I was able to do better with it than I thought I would. I actually have an odd question. Do either of you remember it performing that well? No, my impressions are always, yeah. when I got done, like, oh, thank even, God that's over. Even with the very first test, like, we thought with its first score at the 100 yard that that was god awful. We thought there was, it was tons of other guns were going to blow it out of the water, and yet right. it was one of the top contenders. Yeah. I wouldn't say in. top, but it came right in the middle. It was just above, well, it was like number three number out of three, seven. Number three, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. I guess I think top three. It's like, so strange because that's only by the numbers. Every subjective right. experience is get that thing away from me. But ultimately, yes. what matters is can you put the rounds on the target? Yeah. So fair. it's still awful, but it's just not quite as awful as I had anticipated it would be. True. Oh, such a good rewarding prize. The Hotchkiss. Not as bad as you think it would be. <laughs> All right. Next up is the BAR. Ooh. We had very high hopes for this gun. We did. Um, although we did point something out in the beginning that did stay true was the lack of a bipod. That yeah. really did make a difference in terms of like laying prone with that especially. Now granted, walking fire, it did, you know, it didn't do as much like on target as we would like with a walking segment, but when standing there and burst firing, it did pretty okay. I still say both of those are kind of a disappointment. I believe Ian was the one that said it could use a bipod, and I think that's true. It still could use a bipod. Absolutely. I but it requires I made the, a bipod. I made the mistake of saying, look, this gun is one of two patterns that we've been dealing with that were designed for walking fire so it should do really well at least that no um actually the one thing that it does really well at and that we didn't even test for is that it does really well at just being a really awkwardly large rifle yeah like it's just if you got big old hands this is the rifle for you semi-auto only though because the high rate of fire and the recoil and that sort of pitch and direction while recoiling really keep it from being one of the top performers on the move. 
this is a little bit off topic because it's not World War I specifically, but the thing that really came to light for me as a result of this was understanding the World War II BAR, the A2 version. Because previous to this, every feature I look at on, on the A2, I'm like, they made it worse. They made the sights smaller and more precise, but smaller and harder to use. They slowed down the rate of fire and gave it a fast and a slow setting instead of a semi and a full auto. They added this huge heavy bipod to it. And when I look at it in context of this test now, what I'm seeing is the ordnance department saw oh, we need a bipod because it needs to work prone as a light machine gun. So we'll put on a bipod and a big heavy one like the Lewis gun had or like the several of the others in here have. The big heavy bipod, that's good. That works. And it's not all that accurate when people are trying to shoot it in bursts from prone. So we'll give it more precise sights. We'll give it the sights off of the Springfield 03. And um, we need to slow down the rate of fire because it shoots too fast. So we'll give it a slow setting instead of a semi-auto setting. To, in conjunction with the bipod. And while I don't think those changes worked the way they wanted them to, I can understand now, I think, the rationale behind those changes, which I'd never been able to figure out. No, it's obvious that they were like stacked sequential changes where they're going, yeah, okay, we're going to do this. And as a matter of fact, when you say the bipod, now I can't help but think how much the later BAR bipod looks like the Lewis gun bipod. I mean, the wing nuts and all. And the weight. And, and they made, but they made it wider, which makes it better than Lewis. In it that does, way. yeah. It's more stable than a Lewis gun bipod. Mm. So and they let it pivot, <laughs> which the Lewis doesn't. No, yeah. no, it's not capable. So uh, it, it's weird. It's one of those things that maybe they, it's not as insane as you think it is. It just doesn't work. Ultimately, the problem is that the World War One BAR. The reason it didn't do so well in our testing, not as well as its reputation would lead you to believe, I think, is that it is truly an automatic rifle. And we are testing it as a light machine gun. And it's not that great of a light machine gun. No, it's really not. But you can't really have a, a cool wide scale, you know, testing of all the automatic rifles because there's only two. I will say there's one way in which it might have done very, very well, but it was a test we didn't get around to. We just ran out of time. We were planning a dash and drop test. We were going to right. run, drop, and fire. And we're in fire off of a, a like a barricade, a pile of debris, logs, dirt, like a trench lip or a crater lip. Just and it would enough. have done all right for that. It really would have. would have. After, after yeah. laying them down repeatedly, it's probably the only one that you, because it just doesn't have a bipod, there's no need to kick out and drop, but it's light enough that just for five quick shots on a paper target, man-sized target, if I just drop and shoot a man with it, I'm going to feel very strong about that for the BAR. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I think it's a very good combat weapon. Yes. But that's not necessarily quite reflected in, in the testing that we did. Sorry. Unfortunately not. Uh, next up is the 8mm Shosha. You know, that one, uh, it did slightly better than what I was expecting. I remember expecting. somebody saying that it was going to do pretty well. I wouldn't know anything about that. Someone who has <laughs> invested a lot of money into Shoshas so, might yeah. have crashed his own retirement plan <laughs> with this testing. See, even though you gave us that impression that it was going to do well, I still had my reservations about it, and those reservations kind of came to light as we were using it because it was still, it was very awkward when laying prone with that thing. It just, you can't get your head behind that. I never, no. ever was able to line up with that sight picture. Never, not even once. I agree. Um, it did not do as well as I expected that it would. Now, it didn't crash and burn. No, um, it didn't. And it was reasonably close to my expectations, but I, I painted a bit of a rosy picture uh, going in, and yeah, and it, it hurts a little bit to see that shattered, but I try not to actually have an emotional attachment to something like this. I'm yeah. sorry. I still like it for its history. You know, its history doesn't change as a result no, of this. No, it doesn't. I want to point um, out that he did have an emotional attachment to it. It's just that now he's a horrible cheater because he's fallen in love with another, as we're going to hear later. <laughs> oh, yeah. But... Maybe. Um, when we're talking about the show shot, an interesting thing that came up is that we had to prepare these guns to be out on the range. And a lot of that came from Mark over at Anvil Gunsmithing, like we've said a few times. And he and I had a conversation in which he said, understanding this gun in repair has led him to understand it in terms of manufacture. And the show shot is probably way up the list, if not, it probably definitely is the top of the list in terms of ease of manufacturing. Oh, without any doubt. In yeah. war. Yeah. The ability... The, the number of Shosha in the conflict compared to the number of any of these other guns. Well, maybe the light machine gun you have 
is better than the light machine gun you do not have. And there's also a thing from a larger scale, the light machine gun that you have 250,000 of yeah. is better than the light machine gun that those guys have half as many of. Yeah. yeah. I mean, can two toe shaws do enough damage to offset one 0815? It's like Charmins and Tigers. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's an element there that's not showing up in this test because right. we're evaluating it as if we're millionaires that are going to buy only one type of gun. Right. I often try to refer to it, as, compare it to the Sten gun. That's fair. It's crude, it's simple, but you know what? It's cheap. It was able to be produced in huge scale on a very short time frame, and it works. I mean, if you can pick any submachine gun, are you going to take a Sten? No. But if a Sten's what you've got, you can make a Sten work. And I think the same applies to a Shosha. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, next up is the Mabson. This is one that gets a lot of uh, a lot of question, a lot of mythology. Like, why weren't there more Madsons? Is it because, like, there was some problem with them? Or international conspiracy? Or... You know... <sighs> We talked about this. The big thing with the Madsen is it was being produced by a country that did not want to get overtly involved in the war. And so it's a gun that saw very, very limited use. And so it's represented a big mystery for us. I think you've handled a later production Madsen. Semi-auto and full-auto examples, but of a, like a 40s, 1950s version. Now think about that too, because the difference between technology that was roughly honed out by 1909, 1910 with minor modification in 1914 to get this guy, and then skip all the way until late 40s, early 50s when you know they decided, we're gonna try this again, we're gonna standardize everything, we're gonna go with a universal frame, we're gonna clean up all the problems with this gun. I mean, it's a bigger step between the early Madsen and the later one than it is between the BAR and the A2, like World War II, like, yeah. like it, it, it's the same core mechanism, but all those little things that get rolled into it that make them distinctly different, that happened in the Madsen as well. And so none of us were ready for what does the early Madsen do That's in the Great War. So I want to say I had a little of a cheat because I had had it on hand for a little while. May and I had to help walk it in. Uh, by discovering what was wrong with this one. Mark ended up replacing a part that functioned, I'd say about 90%, so I would give him high praise for replacing a very finely machined part with a very quickly machined part. To be clear, he didn't replace a part, he fabricated a part yeah, with, without having the original to work from. Basically right. had some wow. like dark pictures from up at, who was it provided? Oh yes, thank you Alex up at the Springfield National historic site for providing that photo because it's the only way we knew with the shape of what was in there it was unbounded on one side so we had no idea what the top of it was supposed to look like without that photo and still we had to kind of walk it in yeah. but um the gun ran very very well for having something so finely fitted in there that had to take extreme pressure yeah. so very good short work on his part so we have the gun it runs i thought very well Mm -hmm. um, the only problems we had with it, I thought, were problems that were actually part of the design, mostly stemming from the overextended follower, in my mind, and the way it sort of has a last-minute little hopper basket that confuses unloading and leads to the possibility of misfeeding if you're really not paying attention to what you're doing. Outside of that, though, simple, simple, simple mechanism. Breakdown was pretty clear, reassembly a little more difficult, and it looks... To, at a glance, the Madsen looks like it should be as fiddly as the Hotchkiss in terms of operation, and it simply is not. It's yeah. such a simple gun. Um, May, you're so used to handling all these. Did anything stand out as remarkably odd about handling it once you picked it up? So the one of the weirdest things on that gun was the ejection port on it. It's it's in a spot in which you're holding your left hand forward. And Othias did this in the video. You probably popped something here or there about it. But like basically, it looks like you almost could end up accidentally catching some rounds as they're being ejected out the bottom. Thought this would be a problem. Turns out, no, not really, because it pretty much ejects the rounds back and like down. So it really does just kind of like fall behind his hand every time. So we didn't have to sweat that. I did not get burned. Which is great. And then the only other thing was just how vague that sensation is of uh, towing the magazine in. You really just can't tell that it's a positive, it's positively set in the position. Yeah. You know, the, the, um, one of the awkward things there is there's really no front grip for your hand. No, there's really none. But a lot of the guns that were actually in use by the Austrians during World War One had like a hand hook uh, cut into or added into the buttstock to so you bring your support hand in and control the butt of the gun. Yep. 
Um, and, in really what is a pretty modern technique. Yeah, and that allows you, again, that nice elevation control from the rear. And then we've even right. seen one photo with a wood four stock from that yeah. period. So it, it seems like not every, It seems like there's some debate as to what to do with the other hand with the Madsen even then. And there's so much variation in Madsens. Uh, it's bizarre. It was, it was low production. It was a commercially sold gun. And every run just, was... Yeah. Yeah. Everyone was customized to whatever production line. So we got yeah. an early, we're lucky to get an early Madsen because these are always done in like little 50 unit increments and then they're just consumed or converted or whatever. Yeah. So um, overall impressions though, where are we at? Well, in my initial impressions, I thought that the Madsen was going to be the overall winner in this test. I thought this was going to be the one that would just blow everyone else away. And on the one hand, it wasn't. But on the other hand, there was nothing really wrong with it. It just wasn't quite as good across the board as the gun that did end up being the best. So yeah. the bipod is, it's good. It's not quite the best, but it's its pretty good. It's lower than almost all the others, which is nice. See, I didn't really have a problem trying to elevate my body to get into the bipod, but it's extendable if you're in a terrain that requires a longer bipod. The magazine change is a little finicky, but otherwise, very fast, which is nice. The caliber was fantastic. Seven millimeter Mauser is a really nice soft shooting caliber, and that pairs very well with the really fairly light weight of the Extremely Madsen. Extremely light. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. I don't know on the actual scale, I mean, we'll have the stats here for the show by the time it's up, but in terms of actually just picking up and moving with it, it's that and the BAR. And, I mean, it, and it's nicely two. balanced too. There's not a lot of weight out front. It's kind of dense in the center. Little balance on the butt, little balance on the, the barrel end. Um, overall, like, if I thought it was going to be 90% across the board on everything, it ended up being like 80% across the board on everything. That's fair. Just short of expectations. And it has a lot of potential. I think basically all of the, all of the, 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 like the theoretical hype about the Madsen is pretty much true. Yeah, in theory. Like, you practice it and there's some limitations to it, but... It also is not magical. I want to point that oh, out. Oh, no. no, no, no. Yeah. Every time we talk about, I don't know about you, every time I talk about World War I and light machine guns and things, the Madsen comes up over and over and over. And because it's so mysterious, there's not a lot of experience with them. What experience there is, is with a much later version of it. Yeah. So it's had time to polish that out. Right. But everybody associates it as being the early one. And so I think, I hope we dispelled some of the myth, but still set a very positive tone for that. Yeah, gun. across the board, there's an assumption, there's, this habit of everyone or characteristic for everyone to assume that the gun that's weird and rare and unknown will just give it the benefit of the doubt on everything. And then maybe we'll take that one notch further and assume it's maybe better than it has any right to be at everything. And you have to you have to watch not watch yourself to not do that. Fair. That said, this is not one of those guns that has some huge hidden skeleton in the closet. It turns no. out, oh, it's rare because it exploded every five rounds. Yeah, there were no surprises with this right. one. It just wasn't as great as we thought it would be. Still very good, just not yeah. as great. All right. Where are we are, at? Are you ready for this one? The next one on my list is the Lewis gun. Uh, I don't know if I want to hear anything else. I think else this one failed everything. About that horrible, everything. horrible Lewis gun. Don't say those things about my <laughs> Lewis gun. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have... Um, I've been in this business for a little while, a few years, and I'm going to be honest with you. I've been working so very hard that I've become a bit calloused. Like, I've lost that collector's interest, that spark, uh, in some regards. But every once in a while, something rare or just unique comes through, and I, I get worked back up again. Um, but almost in that vein, and then even more so a touch of humanity, like a Hallmark movie, I watched a man fall in love. <laughs> Uh, going into this, I had very little experience with the Lewis gun. I did a little bit of shooting a long time ago, and in retrospect, I'm pretty sure that gun was not well adjusted. It was not well timed. The, the spring tension setup wasn't all that well done. Because I do I not. I mean, everyone, <coughs> had, everyone has a bad first date. Come on. <laughs> and since then, I, it, it wasn't, I hadn't avoided them for any particular reason. Just I hadn't really had much contact with Lewis guns. And so. I figured it'd be okay, but it's awfully heavy and eh. Um, and it turns out that in my experience here, it was an absolutely clear winner. And uh, for all that you guys might make fun of me for it, I think you agree. Like I do. I said from the very beginning that I thought it was going to be yeah. really good. However, I want to point something out. I want to make this very clear. 
Um, the guns we have are over 100 years old, mm -hmm. and they are worn in different places, and we have tried our best to maintain them and to repair them, but there's always something. We saw this with one of the Shoshaws that had some separation at the rear, and we had to tighten it back down on the field and then back with, you know, the shop. But... Imagine racing with 100-year-old vintage race cars. Without, you know, complete replacing of parts either, just minor, you know. Yeah. So the thing about that Lewis gun, I want to be very honest, May and I experienced that Lewis gun, this exact gun, a few years ago. It belongs to a friend of ours named Jeff, and he was kind enough to loan us to it. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff has done an excellent job of not only conserving his gun, but he has proactively gotten behind repairing. He had spare parts. He had other things that could be fitted. He sent them to Mark. It's been in Mark's hands for several months. And so it has, in fits and spurts, had things tightened up. It's had parts shaved a little bit so that they're no longer binding. It has been dialed into how it should have been at that time. Eh. We still had a couple little short strokes. We had a couple little jams here and there. Oh, yeah. It and wasn't a, perfect. But a lot no. of that, again, has to do with the fact that even now, as good as that gun performed, I know for a fact that that barrel's got a little bit too much wear in it. It probably needs what is a major surgery to get it back to factory. So it's been set as well forward as any of them, if not more forward in terms of repair. Still not perfect. And this is what we're getting. So we could have maybe seen a benefit from having a perfect Madsen or a perfect whatever as well. Um, however, thank you, Jeff, for making sure that I was well educated on how to time your gun and therefore could time it for all of us because that proved very crucial. All that being said, it's not like the Lewis is an outlier here. And this particular Lewis is just way nicer than all the regular other Lewises. Right. The Lewis gun was a magnificent gun in oh, this context. Yeah. Oh, beautiful design. And you know it's a good design because if it's a fantastic machine gun design before the 1930s, uh, the U.S. will not adopt it. Right. So since they just vaguely adopted the Lewis and never fielded it, we ha it must have been a good one because we would much rather field a bajillion Shoshas or something else. Yeah. So Sounds right. It's just, it was the, the shooting impulse, the recoil impulse, um, the way that the action was designed. And it's... Actually, you know what? If I look at these guns now, the ones that saw later development, the BAR, but the BAR turned into a medium machine gun. The BAR basically turned into the, the FN 240. Um, the Shosha went nowhere. As a long recoil system, it disappeared. The Hotchkiss system pretty much disappeared by, by World War II. They were all gone. Um, the Madsen kept going. It was a good enough system that it stuck small, around, but it never really... Small sales for its whole life. Right. The one that actually saw major later development was the Lewis. It turned into the FG42, and then it turned into the M60. And the FG42 is in some ways as impressive of a gun in its own uh, category as the Lewis is in its category. Yeah. The M60's got some issues, but... Now this one, this one, you know, Belgium really lit on the design, and, yep. and Britain did. The U.S., like I joked, did not. But uh, in our own group, we're kind of guilty of the same thing. Only one of us spoke up at the beginning of this and said the Lewis gun was going to be it. Well, I didn't say it was going to be it, but I was very confident in its performance role. I, oh, honestly, you knew it, and you just didn't tell us. Well, no, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I technically said it she told us. To, I just didn't say it specifically like that. Like off camera, I was like, oh no, I think it's going to dominate. But on camera, I was like, no, I think it's going to do very well. It's because I had the experience of it. I just, I was saying before, like in a, Pre and a previous conclusion for the Lewis episode, but like I put my hand up on the target and just when I noticed that it would, my range of fire was just barely outside of it, I went, oh my God. And since then, I have yet to fire another machine gun that has done the damage in that tight of grouping as the Lewis gun. You know, the, the Lewis was the first uh, machine gun that we ever put May behind. Huh. And so that's what she started oh. was on that particular I did gun. have a good first date then. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, you had a bad first date. Yeah. I had a good one. And so ever since then, it's been everything's been completely Compared back, so well. Someday you'll get to shoot a Stoner sixty three, <laughs> and then you'll experience the magic again. All right. I don't think they had those for this war. No, not for this war. No. Uh, next up is the thirty out six Shosha. Magical. So, yeah. what were our expectations going in? Not great. Uh, they really weren't that great going in. We were expecting some issues with it, and then it got worse. I kind of <laughs> had that hesitation where. All right, this is the dumpster fire gun. This is the gun that everybody's like, herder, it's the worst gun that was ever made. And we all feel very confident in ourselves because we read a paragraph in a magazine 
or whatever, and we've now become an expert. And generally I find that when someone says that the secret weapon Pedersen was the thing that would have won the war in 1919, if not, and it turns out it's a piece of crap. And then you turn around and they go, this is the worst gun ever. And you find out that it had a utilization issue or that it was just misunderstood or misapplied. And so, unfortunately in this case, like I was, I was sort of expecting, okay, I'm gonna pull something out of this 30 six show shot to show people that it's not completely insane. Well, there is something, and really? that is to well, that is to look at at its actual mechanical reliability. Right. Fair. That yeah. gun ran. We had zero issues with that gun the entire time, despite shooting basically the the worst ammo. We're shooting steel cased Russian ammo out of that thing, which he demanded. No, I'm right. I'm off that. And and honestly, the reason I did is because I've shot enough of that that I know that it just runs. And I didn't with a test like this. I didn't want to start experimenting with new ammo right before we do something like this. But uh, the magazines all ran, uh, thanks to Mark at Anvil, again, um, for the work he did on the magazines was cleaning them up and like hammering all the dents out of the magazine. Before bodies. you got here, that was all the problems you had with that gun. Yeah, it was just, and it was basically, all right, this magazine will hold three rounds before the follower gets to a dent. This one will hold 12 and that one will hold nine. Yeah, he and basically like made some wood supports to stuff in them and then slowly like got rid of every single dent that was in there. So yeah. they ran perfectly. Right. And so did the gun. Yeah. Right. We didn't have jams. We didn't have failures to fire. It, it fed from the hip for her when no, others wouldn't. Exactly. I mean, it, the gun goes bang every time. I mean, we could. That's the only thing you can really say in its praise. It's so. like the World War One high point. Yeah. Exactly. And you can be quick to reload on that one. It did have a pretty decent reload time for the test. So. Not as fast as the 8. Not as fast as the But still pretty eight. good, yeah. Compared to some of the others. And finally, to give it a little bit more praise, the foregrip. Yeah, you yes. liked it from the hip. That actually was quite good. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that had the best sort of, of actual controllability from the hip, I think. I, I, I agree. Think the major problem with the 30-06 show shot is that, that that long recoil system was already miserable yeah. in 8mm Lavelle. And it got worse in Ot6. Yes. And yes. Then it's just, the, the, you could almost make a cheek saddle for that gun, extend the sight another six inches to the left, like you were firing an anti aircraft gun, and it would improve the gun significantly. Yeah. Anyway. So that brings us to our very last entrant, which is the 0815 Maxim. And I think uh, Othias and I were the only ones to really shoot an 0815 before, right? You ha This was your first time with no, one? No, I'm I have, in the market. I haven't filmed any. Oh, okay. But I have done some shooting with them. Okay. So we all were pretty knowledgeable about what to expect on this one, even from the get-go. We knew it had a bouncy recoil. We knew this- You knew it had bouncy recoil. I have old footage of the first time she fired one of those, and it's just, oh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, literally just like my face is just bouncing everywhere on that one. So we, we knew some things going into it that it wasn't going to be the most accurate, but we honestly did expect it to do much better when it came to total destruction. We had- I don't know, I don't know. There was somebody I remember on range off camera saying that he just, couldn't stand those things. I feel like my initial impressions of the 0815 were pretty much dead on. <laughs> I, I think that it performed pretty much exactly how I expected it to perform. It's the definition of mediocre compromise. Yeah. It, it, the Germans pushed that thing out because they, they did not have a light machine gun program that they could rely on, that they could put right. weight on. And so, uh, in a way, it sparked the, the universal machine gun program. Kind of, like, yeah. It was this thought of, can we get something that is medium weight that will move with us and carry up the assault? And, you know, going into this, I really thought that if I had to, the way I voiced this was, in World War I, a lot of the role of the light machine gun would be to advance, capture the first trench you can get a hold of, and then there would always be that counterattack. And so my thought is, if I'm in the... If I'm crossing no man's land, I don't want the MG815. It's too much. But if I'm in a recently captured trench and I want to defend it from a now oncoming wave, out of all the things we have, I thought I would want the 0815. Now, thinking about it, yeah, the Lewis gun can do that just as well with fewer issues and more accuracy. But second to that is the 0815, again, only on sheer capacity, volume of fire, and stability of fire without overheating because of that water jacket. Right. But guess what? That's me using it as a rapid emplacement rather than an actual mobile gun. Yeah. In every other way, it's pretty terrible. 
However, by the numbers, eh, we started to see that maybe it wasn't as bad as we thought, that we could sort of hulk our way through it. Right. That ammo capacity, you can put it to use. It's worth pointing out that at the very end of the war, the Germans were were developing or adopting or starting to use the 0818, which was basically an air-cooled version of the 0815. They lightened it further. They got rid of the water jacket, which I think we can all agree is really unnecessary for its purpose. Yes. I mean, especially when you get the barrel out quick, what's the point? Right. And so it would have been interesting to... Had the 0818 actually gone into service, it would have been a really interesting comparison in a test like this to scrap some of the weight, you know, improve some of the balance. Although, you know what? The 0818 had the same bipod still. Which I can't... So... I can't fathom. There must be some reason. I haven't. We haven't yeah. actually done our 0815 episode. I'm going to have to do some hard digging because I cannot fathom why they felt they needed it in that particular in position. It does allow the gun to pivot very easily. One of the things we saw with every other gun, with that bipod at the front, if you want to swing, especially any significant distance, you have to kind of scoot your body all the way around because you're pivoting at the very muzzle. Right. Now pivot smoothly, but yeah, you do got to scooch. But with the 0815, because that pivot point's in the middle of the gun, your body has to move a lot less in order to swing the muzzle around. So there is that benefit to it. And if you're thinking about this is now going to be a an airsots emplaced gun to repel a counterattack, we have to cover a wide sector of fire, and we can shoot for a very long time, Okay, maybe there's some some justification to putting that bipod where it can pivot well. Some like I'm not I wouldn't agree with it. It wouldn't be my choice, but I think the what I always try to do is find what is the rationalization for a decision. Even if I don't agree with it, once I understand what why they did it, then you can really understand the gun. Right. All right, guys, so we finally have reached that point, okay? We've got all our numbers in. We've decided to break the test down into point systems. We've got five tests, and we're going to do it on, like, a five-point ranking, so, like, one to five, essentially, to determine where each gun ranked in each test so that we can actually put it number-wise to determine who was the worst and who was the best and where everything else came in between. Last on our list, last on our rankings was, surprise, surprise, the 30-06 Shosha. Yeah, um, I, you just said we have a one to five point scale, which yes. is true. On that 100 yard grouping test, the 30 caliber Shosha did so well that we gave it a zero. Like, yeah. it got an honorary zero because the next up on that test was the eight millimeter Shosha, which did so badly it could only get a one, and the 30 was even worse. Yeah, it yeah. fell off the scale that we had just invented. Right, exactly. That's. Pretty impressive. Not only that, but let's be honest. If you are trying to impress, uh, you know, anyone really, don't punch them repeatedly in the face. <laughs> That's probably the best way to go about it. I mean, I'm pretty sure all of us have left with a little bit of bruises after that. But no, she little just bit. she just didn't perform as well. No, she just didn't perform well at all. We weren't ex we didn't have high expectations going into that with her, and yeah, no surprise there that she even fell short of that. I'm not gonna lie, my expectations were here, in terms of here, like if they were down here, they're somehow down here now. <laughs> they actually went a little bit lower than what I was even expecting How, then. However, again, it worked. Maneuverable, it mechanically did. fine, good luck hitting anything. Yeah. Right, that yep. was the issue, just never nailed it. So overall total was nine out of 25 points uh, for 36% of a possible perfect score. Okay, whopping 36, that's a fail. <laughs> it says something that the best it did was reloading. <laughs> yeah. You can keep jamming rounds in and it'll keep going off, but you aren't going to hit anything. You're just going to startle some cows. <laughs> All right, next up in the um, rankings, very close to that, and unfortunately just barely above it was the Hotchkiss in that situation. Um, she, we were able to put some shots on range, but where... You know, it did put the shots on target. The problem was is that there were a lot of other finicky issues with it. It wasn't really quick with the reloads. It was a really awkward gun in general. It just didn't have great performance overall. And the field strip on that was a little bit awkward too. I was going to say, but you know what? At least it was decent to take apart. The, the interesting thing oh. is the, the Hotchkiss really, oh, yeah, it, yeah. it, it really loses in the edge test. Once the bullets start flying, the gun actually does fairly well. Yes. The problem is getting the bullets to fly. This is the exact inversion 
of the 30 out 6 show shot. Exactly. 30 out 6 show shot is easy to get running, runs all day, can't hit anything. Now we've got Hotchkiss, which God help you to get it loaded, and then you can actually hit some things. Right. So, yeah. well, okay. Uh, had one point more at a total of 10 out of 25. By the way, the 25 point scale here means we're pretty granular. Like, you're not going to see a lot of point differences. Um, on a percentage basis, that's 40%. So, a so, little bit better. A little bit better because, you know, ultimately putting your, you know, shots on target is going to end up, I no matter what, that's going to bumper a little bit higher. I, I will say there's one clear thing that I want to say about the 30 out 6 versus the, the Hosh kids because they sound so close together because of our experience. Mm -hmm. There's a key difference here. These are supposed to be crew served. I think crew served with training, that gap between the 30 out 6 Shosha and the Hotchkiss gets much wider. Yes. I think a crew yeah, solves a lot of the problems that brought that Hotchkiss down. The show yeah. shot wouldn't make any difference with the crew. No, you're if, not anything, get... if anything, it would decrease it. Well, yeah, because it's it's all it's all shooter problems. Right. So with a crew, it's still shooter problems. With a crew with a Hotchkiss, well, now it becomes crew problems. Those can be solved. Yeah. So a little bit of love back. Yeah. Yeah. I think we under underrepresent the Hotchkiss just a little bit with yeah. this. Yeah, next time you'll have to give me a hand, and vice versa. So what's up next? Uh, third on the list, it's actually a tie for with both the BAR and the 8mm Shosha. They actually ended up even. We're going to get angry letters. We're going to get very angry letters, but I mean, it, we can't argue with the numbers, people, and with our experience on that one. We have taken the most popular light machine gun slash auto rifle and the least popular... Like these are the two. That's like the story is the BAR and the miserable Shosha, and it turns out they're both sitting right in the middle of the pack together. Well, we said it before. If it just had a bipod on it, could you imagine where it would be in the numbers? Oh, the BAR. Something yeah. so simple would make such a big difference. I found it this to be an absolutely fascinating outcome, and I put together all of these points without, honestly, without any any thought to what the sum totals were coming out to be. And oh yeah, I, well to be fair, let's let's be honest, 5.5 test, 25 points as you covered, right? Mm -hmm. He only has 10 fingers, so there's no way he could know what was gonna happen. Right, it was a mystery going in. And when, I, when it came out as exactly the same numbers for the two of them, I thought, you know what? That's actually kind of exactly right, because for every, oh my God, if only they had done this, it would have been so much better. It's a bipod on the BAR, it's sights on the Shosha. Like, even with the recoil, if you had sights that you could actually use, imagine somehow you could put the BAR sights on the Shosha. Or the Shosha bipod on the BAR. All of a sudden, like, it, it becomes immensely more usable. It's still got some warts on it, but... And, and again, this is a test as a light machine gun, which is not really the strong suit of either of these guns. I think the Shosha slightly in design trends more towards light machine gun in the, in the fact yes. that they included the grip, and they included the bipod. Those yes. two things really push mm -hmm. it away from auto rifle. As a matter of fact, if it were, if we were thinking about a shoulder-fired auto rifle, the show shot is way worse than the BAR because the BAR you shoulder it and fire it, and you can go like that for quite a long time. I don't think I can bring a show shot to standing shoulder fire and comfortably keep that up for very long. But both guns have recoil issues. BAR just high rate of fire combined with powerful cartridge. Show shot still a powerful cartridge but just that horrible long recoil it's system. the operating mechanism. So yeah. in that regard, similar. Uh, magazine release is very positive and quick, but not necessarily the best place um, for the BAR. For the show shot, it's actually slightly better of a positioning because you have some leverage to apply, but then it's this big awkward magazine, which they did as quickly as possible, but still can't be as smooth as just a nice double stack box that you just shove in. So they're getting kind of lined up in terms of quick loading, manageably sized, all those sort of things with like recoil difficulties even. And where they split, I swear, the whole split comes down to good and bad sights, bipod or no bipod. That if you really yeah. want to funnel yep. it into two factors. So steal one off the other, and it should be good to go. Yep, yep I would agree. All right, uh, second in line. It, or, um, actually, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to go up to the first, because the second, who came in second is actually quite interesting. But for first, 
Obviously, guys, it was the Lewis gun. It just came out as the top winner. Realistically, the only complicated things that with that gun were just like reload. Um, and then the walk and fire didn't perform as well with the actual walking part with, you know, not the dump part, obviously that did perfectly fine with that. But no, she was fantastic for long range. She stayed on target. The groupings on that or exactly how we thought it would do. It, it performed very well. Now, the interesting thing is we don't put a lot of value in walking fire, but the test did. This point system went ahead and waited as if we were in 1916 and we thought this was a good idea. So if you take walking fire out, you know, it gets even higher in the list. Yeah. Right, and the burst, like shooting bursts from the, the hip is, I think, a little more relevant of a thing than walking fire. And the Lewis was outstanding at that. And oh, we didn't fantastic. have the sling to do it, too. Right? Yeah, would have been even better with a sling on it. Um, I do want to point out, I forgot to mention this, our third place guns had 13 out of 25 points, which is 52%. The Lewis, in first place, jumped that to 21, or 84% of the potential. I mean, so it, it smoked them. Right. That's yeah. a solid B right there. Yeah. And this is one of those positions where it is a light machine gun and not an auto rifle. Yes. And it's kind of curious that the auto rifles chased so far up this list when it's supposed to be a light machine gun test. Yeah. So I concede. I actually like being kind of contrarian. I would love to say, but what if this gun did this or what if that gun had that? Or in certain situations, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to say the most universally sort of applicable gun here is going to be the Lewis gun. Yeah. Um, now, by the way, Subjective, small-scale test. There could be sure. manufacturing costs. Mm -hmm. There could be uh, jamming issues that, or timing issues, armory issues. There's things that we don't know about the care of this gun that could change this totally. And then something like a show shot that you stamp them out and just send them out could be better. But we're just talking about the shooter's experience, the individual infantry, right? Lewis gun. And we were pretty even in terms of results. Like there really weren't any results from all three of us as shooters that varied. They were actually pretty well even across the board. What was With really, the exception of the reload, I think. In general, what would happen is while our individual times varied a lot, our trends didn't. So, no, almost right. to the percent. Like if yeah. I was 50% slower with something, you were 50% slower with it. It just... Right. It, it would get slightly worse in an exponential way if there were... Uh, more of a sequence to it though, which is how this Hotchkiss got suppressed so fast. Because when you have a seven step loading system, yeah. there's more room for error. And that kind of thing really hung up, especially you may, like I felt bad for you on a lot of these because again, upper body strength has been a big core of some of these and then sequentially trying to get it all right. And you and I are historians, May goes on range, we run her through a couple drills and then her job is to not ever flinch, keep the sights on target. She focuses down on pulling triggers clean, keeping the guns going. Don't shoot that camera. Yeah, and, yeah. and she never <laughs> has to, quote unquote, run the gun in multiple stages. She just has to know whatever complicating loading system once or twice, and then she's out. But then this time, and by the way, she gets a whole day for like three guns or four guns. We've had to feed you seven all at once. Some of you know and some of you don't. And then he and I have been studying these things for years. So we're like, oh yeah, that's because that does this. And you're not, that's not your understanding. You've no, been that's not really been stuff I've used to. I mean, granted, it, there could have been, we just didn't have the time to honestly do any drills with it. That would have probably made a difference, I would think. But it also does just come down to what you are expecting of the guns, I guess. And, and for these... I wasn't, exp or I didn't even think about the possibility of how difficult it would be to be lying prone with these guns and just where I carry my weight. Like I just, I carry it differently than guys. Like it's all in the hips for me and having to like do everything while lying prone was incredibly difficult. I just didn't expect it to be as difficult as it was. Oh, even just the and, short arms. Like, oh, and, I'm sorry. And yet, despite all of this, our results are still pretty much consistent for all three of us. That's right. really consistent. So, um, I always, with a test like this, I'm always very interested to look at it and be like, are, is there some place where we have some embedded uh, prejudice? Like, right. are we doing something? Are we trying to embed our own opinions into this? And I'm really very happy. Part of what tickled me so much to see these final results is that a lot of them were not things that I was expecting. And in some cases, they're you know exactly the opposite of what my personal preference would have been. Right. I didn't come into this wanting to like the Lewis. I came into you this were kind of Lewis blind. You're I was like, indifferent to the Lewis. Yeah, and I really kind of wanted to see the Shosha perform better than it did. 
And it didn't, which kind of is a proof to me that we did run a reasonably blind and prejudice-free test. No, we also say, expected the BAR to perform much better than We it really did. all did, yeah. You know, you said um, unexpected results. Did you want to get to your uh, final point? Because there's two guns. Yeah. If, you, if you're very good with memory games, you know what's going on. <laughs> Y'all remember, I skipped number two right there, but that's because for second place, both the Maxim and the Madsen, they tied for even numbers. What was their percentage count on that? They both had 16 out of 25 points, which is 64%. Yeah, so it's interesting. We have the, the Madsen, which is a light, almost like rifle style setup with very, ac like it has high accuracy, whereas you've got the Maxim, which is this heavy, like, like it's heavier of the light machine guns. The heaviest one we had out there has got water in it, but the amount of round capacity you have with it is just, you know. It, literally, the Maxim is our highest round, high, highest capacity gun in the test. Right. It doesn't, it, it and the Lewis do not have semi-auto fire controls. It's full auto or nothing. And it tied with the Madsen, which was very close to the lowest magazine capacity. It has a capacity of 20. We had a 15 and 18 and then the Madsen at 20 rounds. So one fifth the capacity of the Maxim. And with a trigger that not only had a semi-auto setting, but really was designed to encourage you to use semi-auto. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I so, mean, it's almost hard to, like, again, it's hard to use that gun in auto. You have to snatch the trigger. Right. So to look at these and and, and the outcome being the, the two polar opposite schools of thought, one being big, heavy gun, lots of ammo, pull trigger, hose everything. Volume of fire. Comes out exactly the same as dainty light gun in the lightest cartridge, small magazine, good sights, nice trigger, put it in semi-auto and, and and snipe everything. Marksmanry. And they come out the same. Well, it's kind I think of that's interesting. Fascinating. It's kind of interesting to kind of look at both of them and then see the Lewis gun, which came in between. You know, it's, that's the key. Yeah, that's really interesting because you've got like basically it's like it's heavier than the Madsen, but it's still kind of it's still really sleek in its design. It's got high accuracy. It and honestly, 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 I know we've mentioned it before, but that linear recoil that Huge. kept that gun so steady. That is the biggest, most important thing on that gun. Forget everything else. If that recoil weren't as, weren't as linear as it was, we probably would have had a harder time with it. It would have bounced more. Yeah, I agree. It, it applies all the best lessons from the two guns that sit right up under it. Like it, it almost forms a pyramid. And there's a big jump from our second place ties at 16 points to our first place at 21. That's a 20% jump in score. That is in a huge score. gap. Well, to be fair, you get, I mean, if you, what was the percentages again on that? Give me that. 64% for the Madsen and the Maxim and 84% for the Lewis. That's 20 yeah, if points. You, if you think about it though, it's 40% off of perfect. If you take 10% of the features from one and 10% from the others, you get 20 up over them. I mean, yeah. it's a silly way of discussing it, but that's what's really happening here yeah. is that we have gotten rid of all the recoil problems of the 0815. Yep. And we've gotten rid of the low capacity and finicky issues that go with the Madsen. Mm -hmm. And that set us into a gun that still isn't perfect because it does have to compromise. It's not a instant loading 100 round magazine. So therefore it can't hit 100%. It hits what is the maximum possible within the realm of physics and ergonomics. Right. And you know what's yeah. interesting? This gun, it did even have some malfunctions. I mean, there were moments mm -hmm. where you had to actually pull the charging. Oh, yeah. In time in. test, you were, I mean. Yeah, I had like three or four failures to cycle with it. And it's still, we didn't even get into trying to test, like, how do these guns handle malfunctions and how easy are they to clear? But the Lewis would have been. It would Among have, the worst. Uh, but Among it, the worst. But what we saw was that the most common malfunction is extremely easy to clear. Yes. yes because we did clear them. The when you timed one. it correctly. Uh, sorry. This is one that I have over you is because I've worked with that gun. And until I got it timed, and by the way, a crew would know how to time the gun. That's right. something very important to point out. And Mark did some work for, with the extractors and things like that, too, because it also had some loose extraction. I should have pointed that out before, too. Um that gun, I have still, to this day, and it's been a couple of years now, not figured out how to intelligently and quickly clear a double feed on that gun. Oh, it's terrifying. They're dangerous. You have to have a second person hold the bolt and just sort of pry that cartridge out in a safe direction because once the next round in the line feeds past, that spring clip inside the feed mechanism, you can't go back. So there is one jam that we did not see on that gun that could have ruined certain tests. I mean, wrecked certain tests. 
We did see that on the Madsen though. The Madsen had one where I just blopped the magazine off to the side, although it didn't ruin my time. But, well, it did because I also fed the spring in there. So, again, there's certain tragedies that we haven't shaken everything out. This is not a field trial. This is right. just impressions. And this is not covering everything that possibly, yeah, it's just not covering everything that possibly could happen. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time for that. But I feel like we did a good range of tests here. I feel like we got to actually test a little bit of as much as we possibly could while we had the guns. I'm confident we're pretty close to the reality that is these guns. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, I think we have uh, finished up with the guns here for today. And you know what? It's taken more than just the three of us you've seen on camera and the people that you may have seen on range to get this episode even, or to get all of these episodes even done and possible. We have the owners of the guns who are willing to lend them to us you know, in good faith. Some of them we haven't even met in person, but Will lent us the BAR. Thank you so much. We got to shoot that in Louisiana before, and he was kind enough to send that to us for us to shoot here again. We appreciate that, man. We even got it last minute. We were scared there for a minute with it over the Christmas holiday, but I'm grateful we got it in. Any it was... man that will brave the post office during Christmas time. Right? Yeah. Thank you. And then Jeff, too. Man, you get two thanks for that one because not only did he send us a Lewis gun, but he also sent us his 0815. A man who owns two of the top three. I know. Man, he's really, uh, he's in good standing, isn't he? <laughs> do, we, do we have to send him his Lewis gun back? Uh, no, no, we don't. Sorry, Excellent. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a big thank you to Henry for sending us the 8mm show shot. Um, and also a big thank you to Chuck for providing the Hotchkiss portative. Um, for as much as we bagged on it, it was a fantastic opportunity to get to shoot uh, one of those guns that most people haven't seen on the range and that we hadn't had a chance to really use before. Very unique steampunking looking gun too. I oh, will yeah. say, collectors, I enjoy owning some of the worst stuff. Like, <laughs> it, there's more story there. What are you gonna? Do? This is the best. It's the best, and it's good. I, oh, that's great. <laughs> well, that's not a good story though. I wouldn't know anything about that. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> Gee, let me think. Uh, who am I thinking? Oh, geez, I don't know. Maybe Ian for providing the worst gun in the entire <laughs> lot. Excellent job. Now, uh, last and not least, because this is probably the hardest one. I don't know how we got lucky enough to find this because someone just popped me a good old email. This is just somebody who is watching what we're doing and reached out to us. I love you people who reach out to us. Uh, I get tons of emails with lots of lists and I don't get to use a quarter of them, but this time I did and I will always put them away for search for future use. But... Klaus, you are a saint. Now, uh, we are going to get your gun with the proper part fitting back to you, so that's another bonus for him that he gets a little repair work while yeah, it's yeah. down here. But who the heck has a World War I era Madsen that has 99% of the same parts as the one the Austrians were using? I yeah. mean, the, this evaluation is one I thought I was never going to get to do for my own show because they just don't exist. So, yeah. Excellent piece to loan to us. Now, on top of all of that, it's not just the gun owners, our volunteers like Bruno and John on the range and Jay, who normally helps us out, who also showed up and Susie and those people. We have tons of people check the credits. But Brownell stepped up. And that was awesome. We've said it before in here, it's come up a few times, I'm sure, but we just sent a quick email out and it was like, hey, we're gonna do something kind of big. People are gonna like it. Would you like to help out, it's very expensive. I mean, just our ammo costs alone on this has been astronomical. We, we need thousands of rounds of rifle caliber, kind of obscure, expensive ammo. Yeah, it was crazy. And by the way, we don't know how much we need to the letter. Right. So we got kind of lucky. We didn't go through everything we had, but we can see, we, there was worrisome moments. Yeah. So uh, Brownell stepped up and they actually sponsored some of this content. Not all, but a pretty good chunk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they did it because they wanted it to be done. Because Brownells has really started coming forward with this care for older style firearms history. They want you to do, as Mark from Anvil would say, do the maintenance. They want you to take care of what you have for the preservation of these historical artifacts for the future. And they'd like you to do it with their products. And you know, I know this is technically shilling when you have somebody pay you and then you say something nice about them, but I would say something nice about them anyway. I've never had a single you know problem ordering from them or anything like that. They carry very good products and they're there to support people who collect these sorts of things. We would not have asked Brownells for their support on this and for their help and their involvement if we didn't have 100% confidence in them as a company and if we didn't have a pretty extensive record of working with them independently as just some guy in the world buying stuff from them anonymously. Right. Yeah. So 
we really like Brownells. Yeah, and we've been customers. We are friends. Um, it, it comes recommended from us sincerely. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. So if you did enjoy this, our first collaboration, by the way. Yeah. Uh, finally, this has been requested for quite some time. Uh, I hope we went big enough to meet the expectation. I hope we blew people's expectations. Out oh, we, yeah. we sweated pretty hard on this one. If yeah. you enjoyed it, tell us. Uh, however you're consuming this, Respond appropriately, email, letter, uh, comments, whatever it happens to be. And then especially if you like the idea that it got sponsored, because Ian and I don't get sponsors often because we don't talk about things that people make or buy right now. Right. At best, we get some reseller that'll talk to us. But this is a case where we have a, an interest that overlays. Tell Brownhouse that you appreciated them sponsoring yeah. us. Like, show them some love because that's a very easy way for you to get the content that you want without having to fork over for it. Yep. So, and if you would like to fork over it for it, support Forgotten Weapons, support C and Arsenal, and enjoy the good old fashioned history. And oh, if yeah. you liked this and you think we ought to do another one next year, tell us what you think it ought to be. Yeah, come up with some suggestions, guys. We're open to that kind of stuff. I mean, we listen, we try to listen to our viewers and respond to them accordingly. I mean, even some of the more like harsh commentary, we still we still appreciate that because we're all we're about improving our own product here. So definitely give us feedback. I'll point out that my vote right now is that we find someone that has every rad gun from 80s TV <laughs> and we just pop our collars and go nuts. I would go so 80s with that. But anyway, that's going to wrap us out. Thank you all for joining us for this very large and detailed special. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye. But wait, there is more. As a matter of fact, if you go over to CN Arsenal's channel right now, we have some outtakes from the series that give you a little peek behind the scenes uh, whenever we manage to get an extra camera running, that is. So uh, if you've enjoyed this series up until this point, and, you know, I have, everybody seems to have, well, then now's the time to go over to Brown Owls and just, even if you just go there just to send the email, thanks. Just to prove that when they sponsor uh, gun history for everyone to enjoy, well, that builds some goodwill in the community. I am saying all this not because they asked me to, because they asked for nothing when they contributed to this project. They just thought it was worth doing. That's astounding from a modern uh, company like that. So beautiful, beautiful people over at Brownells. Give them our thanks. Now, if you're enjoying the series and you'd like to keep it on your hard drive and don't trust it to just sort of be hosted on the web forever, well, you can go over to our site and spend $6 on the download. That $6 is really there to cover the cost of hosting distribution and then some profit for this particular series to be shared between Forgotten Weapons and CN Arsenal. And it's honestly a very good way to tell us how much you value this particular effort so that we know what we can put into the next time we do something like this, or if we can do something like this again. It's kind of down to you guys to pick what you guys fund, because both channels rely on patrons and you know people buying merchandise and things like that. This is another case where we can see an impact of just what it is that you guys really appreciate, not just on views, but on actually open up those wallets. And I know, I know nobody likes to hear that, but realistically, when you want to work with stuff that's $3 around, that's what you have to do. You have to plan ahead. So thank you all for tuning in. Again, CNR Soul for the last little bit, and we hope you've enjoyed it.